Very well. Um, now we will start with the discrete time version of the uh, Fourier transform, so which will be denoted by uh, discrete time Fourier transform. Uh, in the literature or on the internet, you may find various versions of uh, Fourier transform. The thing that we saw previously, we, or we have finished, was um, the continuous time Fourier transform. This is the discrete time Fourier transform, and there is also something called discrete Fourier transform. And this thing is not discrete Fourier transform, okay? They, they are different. In fact, discrete Fourier transform is more related to discrete time Fourier series, but this one will give you a Fourier transform in terms of omega, very similar to the omega that we had for continuous time Fourier transform. Um, we can uh, extend the notation of discrete time Fourier series by extending the period to infinity, and meanwhile, what is happening to the formula, just like uh, the thing that we did for continuous time Fourier transform, we ex expanded the continuous time Fourier series with uh, an infinite uh, period, and it gave us the uh, continuous time Fourier transform. A similar thing happens here, but uh, I think that would be unnecessary uh, for the uh, discrete time Fourier transform to repeat that again. Instead of that, I'm going to immediately uh, write down the result uh, which would correspond to the discrete time Fourier transform. And I have to indicate the inverse Fourier transform uh, from the Fourier domain back to time domain. Now, the right-hand side of the equation for the discrete time Fourier transform will look like this. And you will notice that it is similar to the discrete time Fourier series, except uh, it's not a summation uh, within one period because mm, this time the signal is not periodic, not necessarily periodic. Uh, so it's from minus infinity to infinity. And the harmonic frequency uh, is omega. It's not k times 2 pi over capital N. So this thing in Fourier series, it was uh, omega was equal to k times. 2 pi over capital N, okay? There was a fundamental frequency 2 pi over capital N, and K times that were the, uh, the uh, harmonics. And uh, there are, how many harmonics do we have? There are capital N, because uh, after the period, it rotates back to uh, the first uh, Fourier series coefficient. So the Fourier series coefficients were also periodic, repeating themselves in discrete time. Now this is uh, a general way of keeping omega and the, the result will be the Fourier transform. So we have to notate it as a capital X of a function of omega. But I have to emphasize something critical here because the uh, in continuous time Fourier transform we were using here, we, instead of this one, we were saying j omega, for instance, in continuous time. This is the discrete time. Uh, so it could be omega only. In fact, it is a function of omega, but Oppenheim has a, an interesting notation in the book, and that notation is also universally accepted. It is this, e to the j omega. So we don't have j omega, but we have e to the j omega. And it looks rather odd, interesting. I mean, uh, w what the hell is this? We have an e, the Euler constant, the, the j, which is the square root of minus one, and then finally omega, which is the parameter. In fact, this is a function of only omega. It can't be a function of e or j or whatever. Of course, they are just... So why are we uh, explaining it like this? Well, of course, um, in order to separate between the Fourier transform of discrete time signals and continuous time signals, they must have somehow different notations. Uh, but this notation also makes uh, another uh, sense 
because of this e to the j omega is 2 pi periodic okay if omega is omega plus 2 pi then it also gives you the same e to the j omega okay so uh, this also indicates a behavior of the discrete time Fourier transform. This uh, behavior, we can say that because of x of e to the j omega is also 2 pi periodic. So it's not an arbitrary Fourier transform. We don't have a Fourier transform uh, in a low pass shape, for example, centered around uh, from minus w to plus w and everything else is zero. Uh, no, we don't have such shapes. The shapes that we have as the Fourier transform of discrete time signals must be 2 pi periodic. Because uh, of uh, the fact that the discrete time signal has a maximum frequency. Can you guess what is the maximum frequency of a discrete time signal? What is the maximum frequency of a discrete time signal? So this is the question. And the answer is, do you have any suggestions? We know what is the smallest or lowest frequency, it is zero. What is the maximum frequency of a discrete time signal? One. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, th that's not correct, but it's not even correct in the uh, Hertz wise sense. I'm uh, talking about angular or radial uh, frequencies, by the way. What's the maximum omega? Yeah, it's not one. No. Was there an another answer? No, no, it's not one. It is actually, uh, I'm asking the maximum frequency. You're telling me the minimum period, or something like that maybe. Uh, but the uh, correct answer to this one is, uh, omega is equal to pi is the maximum frequency. Corresponding to a, a discrete time period of two. This is the minimum period that you can have for the highest frequency. What is that? Uh, let me show it to you. For example, one up, one down, one up, one down, okay? An oscillating signal like this at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. It goes on like that to the left and to the right on the n axis. This is x of n. I am claiming that this signal that I have drawn is the signal with the highest frequency. Uh, because you cannot have a, a larger oscillation than this one. For example, in continuous time, x of t on t, you can uh, draw a sinusoid like this, and then you can draw another sinusoid with a higher frequency, and then uh, even higher frequency, you can arbitrarily increase the frequency of a sinusoid by squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. So the frequency may go to infinity. The highest frequency in continuous time is infinity frequency. It exists. Crazy uh, oscillations. But in discrete time, you don't have it because the separation between each sample is an integer one. So from zero to one, you, you cannot put a lot of oscillations. You can put only one oscillation. One plus, one minus. One plus, one minus, for example. And this x of n is, by the way, minus one to the power n. And minus one to the power n is equal to e to the uh, j pi to the power n because e to the j pi is minus one. And it's equal to e to the j pi n. What is the frequency of e to the j pi n? Frequency is pi, it's here. The frequency is this, 
j omega n is e to the j omega n is this uh, harmonic and at omega is equal to pi it is e to the j pi n which is minus one to the power n and that is the highest frequency which is telling us that uh, on the frequency axis uh, of uh, not j omega of course e to the j omega capital X of e to the j omega, which is the Fourier transform of any signal, we must have uh, a pi point that corresponds to the highest frequency. And minus pi is the same, by the way, because of the symmetry. And everything after pi, so you uh, go from zero to pi for increasing frequency. And then after uh, pi, uh, essentially your samples at uh, integers will start depicting some uh, lower frequencies. You may also call it uh, like a stroboscopic effect, okay? It, by strobing, if you increase the sampling uh, from pi onwards, actually the corresponding frequency of the discrete content starts decreasing and it reaches back to zero at two pi. Because we know that e to the j two pi is actually one. So when you reach to the frequency of two pi, you come back to e to the zero or e to the j zero uh, pi. E to the zero. That is one. So the zero frequency and two pi frequency are the same. In fact, it's also valid for four pi, minus two pi, six pi, eight pi, etc. They uh, all but integer multiples of two pi will correspond to the zero position. So whatever this shape of x of e to the j omega is, it must be periodic, like, I don't know, maybe uh, something like this. Okay, a shape like this, be between minus pi and pi, and then it repeats itself around two pi in a similar way and around minus two pi, etc. So this x of e to the j omega is uh, necessarily becoming two pi periodic. And that is a critical thing that you must always be aware of. So if I ask you uh, a question of, and we have the formula here. You, here you have the formula of the uh, discrete time Fourier transform. And I give you an x of n, any signal, and I ask you, what is the Fourier transform? That's an exam question, let's say. You apply this formula, you simplify it, you may apply some properties, we will see those properties, and say that, okay, the Fourier transform is this, blah, blah, blah. Now you have to always check your final answer before putting it, putting it inside a box and giving it as an answer. Before that, you have to uh, say this, uh, tell me this, is it two pi periodic? is the answer that you found 2 pi periodic. For example, you find uh, capital X of e to the j omega to be equal to uh, 1 over a plus j omega, which was, by the way, a continuous time Fourier transform of e to the minus a t u of t. Okay. So 1 over a plus j omega is uh, the Fourier transform, you say. I gave an answer. It's correct. You put it inside a box. And I look at it, and I just cross it, and I say it is zero points. It can't be the Fourier transform of a discrete time signal because it's not two pi periodic. One over a plus j omega is certainly not two pi periodic on uh, the omega or the frequency axis, but it must be. So be careful about that. And because of this uh, periodicity, the inversion of uh, the uh, Fourier transform, which gives you the inverse Fourier transform, uh, happens to be like this. There is a 1 over 2 pi. The left-hand side of the equation is x of n is equal to 1 over 2 pi, an integral of x of e to the j omega, e to the j omega n d omega. As you see, it really looks like the uh, inverse continuous time Fourier transform. You just replace n by t and you just say x of e to the j omega, you don't say it, instead you say capital X of j omega, and this really becomes the 
uh, inverse Fourier transform, continuous time Fourier transform. But this one also has another um, important difference, and that is the integration limits. The integration limit is 2 pi. So a duration of 2 pi must be chosen to uh, find the inverse discrete time Fourier transform. It may be from minus pi to pi, from 0 to 2 pi, from pi to 3 pi, okay, you, the shift is arbitrary. You must choose it properly in such a way that you can take this integral. But it's a definite integral and it has the boundaries and the length of that boundary is 2 pi because that is the period. So this is the inverse Fourier transform. A formula here and the Fourier transform, the other formula is here. The discrete time Fourier transform and the discrete time inverse Fourier transform. And the discrete time Fourier transform is 2 pi periodic because uh, the highest frequency in uh, discrete time signals is pi. You increase the frequency from 0 to pi and decrease back to 2 pi, which will uh, go down to 0. And from there on, everything repeats itself. That is the discrete time Fourier transform behavior. This is a necessary and fundamental information that you have to always keep in your minds. Because uh, we will solve a lot of questions, we will solve some examples, we will see properties of uh, the discrete time Fourier transform. Uh, but if you forget about the fundamental properties of the uh, discrete time Fourier transform, which is it must be 2 pi periodic, you will get lost and you may give some incorrect answers, your intuitions may be incorrect. So keep the fundamental knowledge always. Now, however, you will be responsible for solving questions, of course, finding the Fourier transforms of discrete time signals. So let's start doing that. Let us uh, determine the discrete time Fourier transform of some well-known discrete time signals. The first one being x of n is equal to a to the n u of n which somehow resembles uh, e to the minus a t u of t, because this is also an exponential. And this exponential is a convergent exponential, uh, and the Fourier transform will uh, be existing if a is less than one in magnitude. Because as n goes to infinity, a to the n uh, should better go down to zero. Otherwise, we won't have a uh, convergent uh, summation for the formula of the Fourier transform. So we want this a to be less than one. So what is then, under this uh, assumption, what is the Fourier transform, discrete time Fourier transform? It is x of e to the j omega. And as you see, we will usually uh, see some typical examples uh, which we will build other examples upon. Uh, up, upon these. Uh, so uh, uh, they will be available in the form of typical transform pairs, for example, in the examinations. You will know the answer to this. Starting from this one and using properties, you will solve other questions. These are very uh, fundamental examples. But we have to know how the fundamentals, uh, fundamental answers are given. First, let's put everything into the Fourier transform formula, which is this. X of n is a to the n u of n. Now, because of this u of n inside the summation, uh, we can see that uh, the summation n essentially starts from zero, because for all negative n's, u of n will make a zero times everything, and the summation will not be contributed to. So the summation actually starts from zero and goes up, up to infinity, a to the n, and for positive n, u of n is 1, so let's not write it. And e to the minus j omega n. This is the summation that uh, we will evaluate. And this is maybe uh, one of the reasons where uh, in calculus you have seen uh, series sums, or infinite series, power series, etc. This summation can be written in a, a, a combined exponent of this term, a times e to the minus j omega, all together to the power n. That makes a to the n, e to the minus j omega n, right? 
and just say that this inside is, I don't know, uh, some number, let's say B, B to the N. Do you know what is uh, summation N from zero to infinity B to the N? If B is less than one in magnitude, by the way, but if A is less than one in magnitude, A times E to the minus J omega is also less than one in magnitude because the magnitude of E to the minus J omega is one. A complex exponential magnitude is always cosine plus sine, cosine square plus sine square square root, which is one. So E to the minus J omega magnitude is one. A magnitude is less than one. So B magnitude is also less than one. What is summation n from zero to infinity b to the n? You can tell me the answer. Don't you know what this is? n from zero to infinity b to the n. What is this? I'm sure you know it. One. Why did you say that? No, it can't be one. Unfortunately, because when n is equal to one, uh, n is equal to zero, by the way, it is one, and then there is plus uh, a square e to the minus two j omega, etc. It's an infinite sum, and it is in terms of omega, by the way. But uh, from n from zero to infinity b to the n is one over one minus b. Please remember this, okay? That's calculus. Come on. So let's apply it here. The result is 1 over 1 minus a e to the minus j omega. 1 over 1 minus b, in other words. Okay? This is x of e to the j omega, the answer. Okay, and that's about it. I mean, you, you found the Fourier transform. This is, congratulations, your first discrete time Fourier transform uh, example, and this is the answer to that. Uh, however, I may ask you to draw something out of it. I may want to plot this thing. It's a complex entity for sure, but just like what we did for uh, continuous time, I may ask you to draw it, draw the magnitude of it. So for instance, what is the magnitude of x of e to the j omega? And I may ask you to draw the angle of it, which I will not, okay? Because it's not so important for naming the behavior of um, x of e to the j omega, is it low pass, band pass, etc. The angle does not answer that question, but it's also available. Angle of x of e to the j omega could also be plotted. So uh, let's try to plot this, the magnitude. Okay. Um, How can we draw it? It's on the frequency axis, omega. One over uh, one minus a e to the uh, minus j omega. Hmm. Which value of omega you think would give uh, the smallest value to this expression and which will give you uh, the largest expression? Which, at which omega it becomes largest? and at which omega it becomes smallest. Just look at this. Okay, I'm asking you to look at this. What is an omega that makes this highest and what is an omega that makes it lowest? If A, oh, oh, it depends on what is A by the way. But if A is positive, let's assume that it's positive, like something like 0 0.5, less than one in magnitude, and it is positive, something like 0 0.5. The largest value that this encircled expression attains or gets is happening when omega is equal to zero. When omega is equal to zero, this is one over one minus 0 0.5 times one. So one over one minus 0 0.5, which is one over 0 0.5, which is two. That's the largest value, 2. With the same assumption of a is equal to 0 0.5. If omega is equal to pi, e to the minus j pi is what? Omega is equal to pi, so we have e to the minus j pi. It's minus 1. Okay. So uh, minus 1. Hmm. So 1 over 1 minus 0 0.5 times minus 1, which is 1 over 1 plus 0 0.5. 
okay, which is uh, 1 over 1.5 or 2 over 3. So the smallest is 2 over 3, the largest is 2, and they are at omega is equal to 0 and omega is equal to pi. So I'll try to draw them. In fact, this peak value is uh, 1 over 1 minus a, which is the highest uh, value, and then it shrinks down to uh, at pi, at omega is equal to pi, it shrinks down to 1 over 1 plus a, and uh, towards the negative frequency it also behaves in a similar manner, and then it repeats itself and becomes the larger again, largest again at 2 pi. Like this. So it's 2 pi periodic. It's a shape. This magnitude is a shape that is 2 pi periodic. A question that I can ask, but it will be a vague question, uh, not, uh, not a very uh, rigorous one. Is this a low pass signal or a high pass signal or a band pass signal or whatever? As you see, the frequencies are repeating. But I can say that this is, if I have to give a name to this, I could say that this is a low pass uh, signal because the low frequencies, like from here to here, around zero, in other words, are larger than the high frequencies, which are around pi. So low frequency energy is higher than the high frequency energy for this signal. Therefore, this is a poor man's, let's say, uh, low pass signal. It's not perfect, but yeah, this is a low pass signal. A, a better low pass signal could be, of course, uh, like this. This is an ideal low pass signal uh, from zero uh, or around zero, around two pi, around four pi, etc. So this uh, signal, the rectangular boxes that I have drawn. Uh, for an, another x of j, e to the j omega, uh, would be an ideal low pass signal. So uh, it is low pass because the low frequency is zero and it also repeats itself at pi. It's not zero for all frequencies, it's uh, periodically repeating uh, with a period of two pi. This is a low pass signal. Now look at a high pass signal. This would be a high pass signal because around pi and minus pi, which are here, it contains some energy. If it's a filter, for instance, it is the pass band. And this is therefore a high pass signal. This is a low pass signal. It would be a little bit more difficult to try to draw a band pass signal but it, it could be, for instance, something like this. Okay, uh, around zero and around two pi. Uh, the same two bands. Around minus two pi, similarly, these two bands, etc. This is uh, an x of e to the j omega or a discrete time for a transform that is band pass. You can think of band reject. Uh, I think it would be too com too complicated. So it's not as easy as drawing something on the uh, continuous time uh, frequency of omega, because in discrete time, omega is making everything two pi periodic. So these are just examples. Now let's go back to our. Uh, uh, result, which is the red encircled thing, one over one minus a e to the minus j omega. Uh, somehow start thinking about it, but as I said before, I will not be very much interested in these. And computers can also help you developing these if you wish. Um, first of all, I know a few landmark points. Uh, which one of them is being pi, the other one is uh, zero. When omega is zero, one over one minus 
a times one it becomes and it becomes a real value okay so at omega is equal to zero this x of e to the j omega is real if it is real it means its angle is zero because there is no phase zero phase similarly at omega is equal to pi it be also became another uh, real value therefore um, the, uh, the angle is again zero at omega is equal to pi. So these two points of zero and pi, the angle is zero. From zero to pi, the angle is, um, you have to ruminate a little bit about how the angle is uh, achieved uh, for exponential terms. Um, but I'm not going to go into the details of those, essentially. But it, it is uh, actually negative. And once it gets beyond pi, it becomes positive. And at 2 pi, it again becomes zero. And the angle term, this wave, repeats itself. This thing is also 2 pi periodic. It must be. So this is minus pi. So this angle of x of e to the j omega, naturally, since x of e to the j omega is 2 pi periodic, both its magnitude and its angle or its phase are 2 pi periodic uh, like this. You may try to uh, plot a few more uh, phase terms on the internet using MATLAB or anything that you may think of to maybe to develop some more uh, intuitions about how the uh, phase diagrams may look like. But uh, magnitude diagrams uh, for our purpose and for the exam, to be honest, will be more important for you. So you have to develop uh, good skills for drawing. And I usually uh, put some landmarking points uh, to see what's happening in between. By the way, I can ask the same question, which uh, gives uh, x of e to the j omega to be equal to 1 over, what was it, 1 minus a e to the j omega, minus j omega. Okay, let's say that this time a is equal to uh, minus 0 0.5. It's negative. It's still less than 1 in magnitude. If it is negative, then this 1 over 1 minus a will be essentially the smaller one. And 1 over 1 plus a, this one, will, will be the larger one. So if a is negative, then the magnitude of x of e to the j omega would look like this. Let's say this is pi. So one over one plus a, uh, sorry, one minus a. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, which is at omega is equal to zero, is a smaller value. At pi, it becomes one over uh, one plus a, this place, one over one plus a. That will be a larger number because the denominator becomes smaller and everything repeats itself. So this one, is it high pass or low pass is the new question. And immediately we see that around pi, which is the highest frequency, uh, the energy content is higher than the lower frequency energy uh, around zero or around two pi. So this is more like a high pass signal. Whereas this one for uh, A is equal to 0 0.5 would make a low pass signal. Let me write the low pass and high pass signals and you will understand why the first one became a low, low pass and the second one became high pass because if a is equal to 0 0.5, what was the question, by the way? Let's go back to that. x of n is equal to a to the n, u of n. a is 0 0.5. So the signal is 1 and then 0 0.5 
and then 0 0.25 etc it is decreasing in magnitude like this a decaying exponential okay like this and when a is equal to minus 0 0.5 it becomes oscillatory on the n-axis this is x of n i'm trying to draw on the axis of n at zero it's again one but at one it becomes minus 0 0.5 and then plus 0 0.25 and then negative and then positive and then negative and then positive. So as you see, this is oscillating. Oscillating. And oscillating at the highest frequency actually, one positive, one negative, one positive, one negative, that is the component at pi. Pi is the uh, plus minus plus minus plus minus oscillation. So this is, the high pass and this is smooth low pass signal that we have okay now let us see uh, another example this may be the last example that we will see for today we will continue seeing discrete time Fourier transform examples uh, let me open a new page and uh, do this new example in a new page x of n is equal to a to the n in absolute value and again of course this a should better be less than one in magnitude otherwise as n goes to plus infinity or minus infinity uh, if a is less than one in magnitude it will be a decaying exponential if a is negative and less than one in magnitude, it will be oscillating and decaying. If A is positive and less than one in magnitude, then it will be just smooth uh, decaying to two sides. Therefore, the Fourier transform of that, X of E to the J omega is equal to, let's first write it, let's not hurry up the uh, solution, A to the absolute value N, e to the minus j omega n. This is the Fourier transform formula. And um, absolute value of n is uh, behaving differently. It becomes minus n when n is negative, and it becomes n when n is positive. So the summation I split into two parts. One of them is for the positive part, let's say, from zero to infinity, then it becomes a to the n, because for positive n, absolute value of n is equal to n e to the minus j omega n plus all the others, the negatives, from minus infinity up to minus one, okay? Let's not do it uh, up until uh, zero because then it means we are including the a to the zero term or n is equal to zero term twice in uh, both of the summations. We have to include them into one of uh, the summations. If n is negative, absolute value of n is minus n. So a to the minus n, e to the minus j omega n. And I have to uh, evaluate these things. Using the power series summation formula, I already know the answer to this one, by the way. It was one over one minus a e to the minus j omega. See, we found it before, it was the previous. Uh, Excuse me, J omega n omega. Kadir Kemal asked a question. Hocam, n eksi sonsuzdan eksi bire giderken e üzeri J omega n olmayacak mı? No, 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 no. Ah, I see, I see your question, and the answer is no. Uh, see, this this part is always e to the minus J omega n. I mean, that is in the formula. It is e to the J minus J omega n. It's the uh, Fourier transform formula. It is a to the absolute value of n that changes with respect to whether uh, n is negative or n is positive. When n is positive, a to the absolute value of n is a to the n. When n is negative, a to the absolute value of n is a to the minus n. But uh, meanwhile, e to the minus j omega n is always e to the minus j omega n. It's, it's the uh, same term, okay? 
I understand your question and I understand your concern, but I hope that I, you understand my answer, okay? We don't change it to e to the j omega n here. It is still e to the minus j omega n. All right. Um, now we have to uh, take the, the second term. The, the first term is therefore the one that we have solved as the first example. Uh, and the second one here um, is a different uh, term and that different term needs elaboration, okay? Uh, which I'm not gonna do because I don't have th that in my notes right here. Therefore, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I would like to go into the details of that, but instead of that, I will just give you an answer. The only thing that you have to be careful about the second term, uh, power series infinite summation, is that it does not include, include zero, okay, the zero term. And therefore, it's not the same formula as a regular uh, power series summation, like a b to the n, n from zero to infinity, or n from zero to minus infinity. Instead, uh, it is from one, which needs uh, the subtraction of the zero term. So you, you uh, perform as if you include zero, and you find the power series sum first, and then deliberately subtract the n is equal to zero term from that, you will find the eventual summation over there, which is uh, this from the left-hand side, and the right-hand side of the summation is a e to the j omega divided by one, uh, no, it's not plus, it's a minus, one minus, uh, a e to the j omega. So that's that's the answer essentially. And in this answer, we have in the denominators. Let's uh, for the time being, let's forget about this numerator. Let's just look at these two denominators. Very luckily, these two denominators are uh, conjugates of one another. So if you multiply the first term. Uh, with the second one and the second one with the first term, etc., the denominator automatically becomes um, real values. So I will multiply the left hand side with one minus a e to the j omega and the right hand side with one minus e to the minus j omega and sum up everything. And when I do that, I come up with a real valued uh, expression. Not nothing with respect to j, okay, and that is one minus a square. But of course, this requires a lot of simplifications, and after the simplifications, you will see that divided by one minus two a cosine omega uh, plus a square. So this is after the simplification what we get, and it is real. Why is it real? Because the signal x of n a to the absolute value of n is a symmetric signal and we know that symmetric signals will give you real valued Fourier transforms. Real valued Fourier series coefficients too. Okay, because of the symmetry. So we come, we come up with a, a real valued x of e to the j omega Fourier transform. Excellent. Now, as a, a final check, I recommend that you um, make a check whether this uh, expression is 2 pi periodic or not in omega, of course. Is it 2 pi periodic with respect to omega? I can see that the only place where uh, omega appears inside this formula is cosine omega, and cosine omega is definitely 2 pi periodic, therefore this is 2 pi periodic, everything. The whole complicated expression is also automatically 2 pi periodic. Was it two pi periodic with the previous example? This one. Let me put it in a red box. Is this Fourier transform two pi periodic? It is uh, the only place where omega exists is 
at e to the minus j omega, and e to the minus j omega is clearly uh, two pi periodic. So one over one minus a, a times e to the minus j omega is also automatically um, two pi periodic. So we didn't check, we forgot to check. I'm sorry about that, now we are doing it. But the answer is correct, yeah, it is two pi periodic. So is this one. This one is also two pi periodic. <clears throat> Now we can start at this point. We will continue with some further uh, examples, and those further examples will always give you Fourier transforms which are 2 pi periodic. Keep in mind that critical observation. So we can stop at this point, but if you have any questions, you can ask. I can wait for a few seconds if you have any questions. Otherwise, we will just continue from the concept of discrete time Fourier transform for a few more hours. All right. So I'm stopping uh, now. We will meet next week, Monday, same place, same hour. All right. See you until then. Bye-bye.